Okay? Give me a difference between shaping and training. Yeah, okay. Well, so, I'm afraid to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so training is usually when we put our when our training hat is on and I'm gonna tell you dog sick, okay? So I kind of define training as a dog really understands what they're doing already. If your dog knows sit, in other words, you condition your dog, the dog knows how to put its butt down, how to sit correctly, okay? And you are just basically working on a behavior that the dog already knows, okay? I kind of consider that training. However, shaping is where basically we are asking the dog to do something, but there's never a command. There's never an association to the command until we get the correct muscle memory, okay? So I'm going to use you for a minute. I can use my friend Rebecca here. So, okay, let's say Rebecca, let's say I walk up to Rebecca and I put my hand out, okay? Now, do you notice what she just did? She put her hand out. Now, if I give her a hundred bucks, okay? Okay? <laughs> and then I walk away and I walk up to her. What she, yeah, right? What did she just offer? She offered both hands. Did I have to put any verbiage to it? Okay, did I have to show her anything? Okay, so automatically she's starting to learn, wait a minute, if I do this, I get this. Okay, this is simple shaping, thank you. You did awesome. So this is simple shaping. Basically, we are luring, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We are luring the dog. We are not putting this on a command. This is one of the hardest things that I have to work with people on. They always wanna put a command to it right away. So let's say I, she doesn't have to stand up, but let's say Rebecca and I did this again. And I walk up to her and I extend my hand and I say shake. And she doesn't put her hand out, okay? And then I grab her hand and I shake her hand and I, and I give her a reward. Okay, so next time I walk up to her, I say shake. She doesn't put her hand out. I grab her hand, I shake it for her, and then I reward her. So what am I teaching her? To be still. To be still, to sit there and wait for me to grab her hand in order for her to get the reward, right? So therefore, I am doing the work and she is not learning it. However, if I provide an opportunity for her to realize that, oh, this is what I, he wants, and then I reward her for it, now the dog learns it on their own, but there's no command. So let's say we do this 10 times. Out of 10 times, she does it seven times incorrectly. In other words, when I walk up to her, extend my hand, she doesn't put her hand out right away, or she just waves at me or offers something else, okay? And then three times she does it correctly. What muscle memory is she gonna learn? The correct or the incorrect? The incorrect, right? Okay, so if I walk up to her and I extend my hand, I say shake, and I do it seven times wrong, what did I just do to myself? Yes, exactly. I just told the dog. I just told the dog that okay. I really want you just to wait there until I grab your hand, and then I'm going to put a command to it. Does that make sense? So don't put a command to your behavior until the dog firmly understands the correct behavior, the the almost the entire picture. It's one of the hardest things we have to do because everybody. And if you go to if you've ever taken like a PetSmart classes, what do they do? They push on the butt. They tell the dog to sit, and then they reward the dog, right? So what did the dog just learn? You're going to do the work for me. I'm going to wait till your hand pushes my butt down, and then you reward me. So it's basically like you telling your kids, hey, please go clean your room. They don't clean your room, and then you give them a bowl of ice cream. And then you clean the room for them. Did the child learn anything? Guarantee they did. Oh, they learned very well. They learned if I don't do it, mom's going to give me ice cream, and she's going to do it for me. Okay. So a lot of what we're going to cover is basically simple parenting, and I'm not a parent. Okay. So let's talk about free shaping. Now this is a this is a relatively kind of new concept in dog training. I say relatively new. Maybe it's been around, but it's something that's now been uh, more recognized that we do. So shaping is something that I am hoping the dog offers a behavior. In other words, I am in, I, I'm trying to show the dog a little bit of the picture, hoping the dog will take the initiative and kind of learn on their own. So free shaping to me, now you may go to somebody else and they, what the hell is he talking about? So this is why I didn't necessarily come up with these terms. I may not be explaining them correctly like somebody else would. So everything I say, question it. Don't ever take what I say or anybody else says as the truth, go question it. 
Science says if you want to prove a hypothesis, you have to test it. You have to test at certain times, and then you basically have to come up with a hypothesis to say, okay, this is the correct answer. So don't take anything I'm saying throughout the whole day as golden word. You need to go prove it, test it yourself, ask other people, and then decide if it's right for you. Okay, so free shaping I define as this, and I'll give you an example. So with my puppy, one of the things I do with my puppy is every day I have three pieces of cheese. Okay, my puppy is six months old, actually about seven months old, but I have three pieces of cheese. And the reason why I have three pieces of cheese is I want to make sure I don't overtrain my puppy because it's really easy for me to get ambitious because I see my end goal. I see this dog and I say, oh man, I want my puppy to be there. But if I overtrain my puppy or if I ask too much, now I'm doing less engagement. Now he's going, oh man, I got to do this. Okay, so I limit myself to a certain amount of food each day so I make sure that I don't overtrain my puppy. So a lot of times what I do is I get my cheese out in the morning. Um, I don't do, so I have a fortunate job. Um, I don't do dog training for a living. I work for a brokerage company and then I have an online business. Okay, so I'm home all the time. This is what allows me to do this. So in the morning, um, while I'm getting, while I'm kind of doing my other job, I have food. I'll do a little work with the puppy, okay? And then I will wait. And I'll wait till the dog starts offering me behaviors, okay? The moment the dog offers me behavior, whether it's to get beside me, whether it's to come up and push me with his nose, whether it be to come up and look at me, okay? I'm not initiating anything. I'm not trying to shape any behavior. I'm not doing anything. He's saying, oh, dad, I want to offer this behavior, okay? I consider this free shaping because the moment he starts doing this, I reward him. However, if he does it incorrectly, I don't reward him for doing it incorrectly. I don't reward him for tries. I reward him for doing it correctly, but I am not initiating it, okay? Because I want to be able to take my dog to the field, and I want my dog to say, oh, man, I want to go work with dad. I want to go start offering him behaviors. One of the worst things I see is people go out, and the dog's like, oh, hey, what's that over there? What's that over there? And they're working so hard to get the dog's engagement. Now what are they teaching the dog? They're teaching the dog that they're going to do the initial work. Here's a concept for you. Do you realize how much you work for your dog? It's kind of like Rebecca here. If I had if I had a box of hundred dollar bills, okay, should I work for her to give her the money, or should she work for me in order to get the money? She should work for me, right? So what are we doing with our dogs? We go out, we playing with them, right? They love playing. What are we doing? We're using food. They love to eat, right? We're using good high value food, chicken, hot dogs, right? These are things that the dog really likes. However, we go out and we are start we work for the dog. Well, no, the dog should work for us. Okay, so um, I use my morning feedings as training. I use, I mean, every every time I work with my dog, it's a training opportunity. Um, if you if you know my friends and know people in my life, when they come over, don't do that with my dog. Don't do that with my dog. Why? Because if they do something with my dog, it's a training session. Yes, I do allow people to interact and pet my dog, things like that, but I'm very, very particular, and I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm really particular because I want it very black and white because if I am teaching the dog one behavior, let's say I'm teaching the dog to down, okay, and I'm teaching the dog to down a, a correct way, and one of my friends comes over, and they tell the dog to down, the dog just flops down, and then they say, good boy, or reward the dog. Now what's happened? Now the dog's like, wait a minute. Oh, I can do a sloppy and get away with it, okay? So I know I got a little tangent there. But do, do we kind of understand free shaping? Basically, I'm rewarding the dog for offering correct behaviors. I'm not necessarily initiating it. So anytime the dog thinks, oh, man, this can be an opportunity to train, okay? Next cut we're going to talk about is marking behaviors. So marking behavior is pretty simple. I'm sure you guys are already doing it, but let's talk about it a little bit. So if I... If Rebecca comes up and I extend my hand, she extends her hand, okay, I mark the behavior with a yes. Now one of the big things that people mess up a lot of times is they misinterpret marking with rewarding. Okay, So I try not to yes and feed the dog. Yes is my, yes is my marker word. Okay, Yes is basically – who uses a clicker here? Raise your hand if you have a clicker. Okay, Basically the yes is basically a clicker. It's not – Clicker's been around for many years. Pablo came up with the idea. Um, you guys all knew who Pablo is, right? Okay. So Pablo learned that, hey, condition behaviors with a particular sound. But the clicker is not has nothing to do with the sound. The clicker is basically timing. As people, we are too slow. We are too thinking. Okay, wait a minute. Should I do that or should I not do that? The moment it takes for you to think, should I do that or not do that, it's too late. This is where the clicker. Why? Because we like to push buttons. But one of the hard things in dog training we find is... People over click. They click, 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 okay? 
pretty soon the clicker has no meaning. If every time we just click, 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 now the dog's like, oh, okay, I don't know what mark your behavior you're marking. So I use a yes, but the yes does not necessarily follow a reward right away. Okay, this is where it's really gonna get confusing with you guys a little bit. I'm gonna confuse you and I'll try to explain it. So I didn't come up with this concept. Uh, there's another gentleman from Hungary that came up with this concept, but basically I implement it because I really like it. I use a yes and a double yes, okay? So a yes is marking the behavior. Okay, a double yes is a release from the behavior, meaning the reward's coming or you can go get the ball. So you notice the ball was on the floor here with Zito, okay? That was his reward. He knows where his reward is at. Okay, he didn't get the ball. If you notice when he is, the ball is on the ground, I came over and I'm like, hey, do you want that? He knows, technically you should know, he should know not to grab that ball until I release him, either with a free command or a double yes. So what I do is, can I use you for a minute? Okay, so stand that way. Okay, so let's say, we'll get into this a little bit. Basic positioning and healing are two different muscle memories, two different, total two different things, okay? So let's say, uh, Rebecca is going to work on healing in a moment, okay? So I'm beside her, okay? And she wants to, let's say, she wants to free shape. So she's done a little shaping of I understand to look up at her. However, now she's going to see if I offer the behavior. And so I'm sitting here, I look up at her, and the moment I look up at her, she's going to say yes, okay? Yes. Good. And then she rewards me, okay? Yes did not mean I got the reward, okay? You can either do that, or this is one of the things I do, okay? I'm going to look up at her. She's gonna say yes, okay? And then when she goes to reward me, she's gonna say yes, yes. She's gonna double yes me. Yes, yes. Okay, and then I get fed and released. So now what happens is the dog is learning, wait, the double yes means I'm gonna get the rewards coming. Oh man, I like that double yes, right? I really like that double yes. So now look at some concept here. Later, when we're healing along, walk a little bit, we're healing along and look at her. Let's say I look away, I look back at her, and she says yes. Now, what's my brain thinking? Did she say exactly? Did she say it twice? Man, I like that twice. Wait, did you say it twice? And my drive goes up, okay? It's a way of bridging. We'll talk about it in a minute. It's a way of start getting longer, lo a little more drive into your obedience, okay? And clicking, if you're going to use a clicker, it would be a click to mark the behavior and then a double click that the reward is coming. Does this make sense? I know this is a new concept. I know this is a confusing concept because in the end, in the beginning, what did we do? We clicked and fed, we clicked and fed. We loaded the clicker, which is fine. But just because you, the dog hears a click, do they get out, thank you. Does the dog get out of the behavior, okay? Here's another reason why. Can I use you, Sarah, for a minute? Okay. So Sarah, face that way. Okay. So, uh, okay, so you're gonna be the dog, okay. So I'm in the ring, we healed around the ring, okay? We're all in a, in a lined up in a sit stay, okay? Now let's say she's practicing, okay? I walk away, she, she's sitting there, I turn around. Now let's say she's working on the dog not looking at other dogs beside her, right? Okay, she looks at Sally over there and now looks back and I click and I wanna mark that behavior, but I'm back here. What does the dog do? If every, exactly, <laughs> because the dog's not stupid. The dog just realized, wait a minute. Don't, thank you, Sarah. The moment you click, there's a reward coming. So if Sarah's 10 feet away, or if I'm 10 feet away, and I reward, do you think the dog's gonna sit there and say, oh, I want the reward to come to me? The dog's gonna all run to him, okay? So this is why we use a double click or a double yes. We release the dog from the behavior, but we can still mark the behavior. Does that make sense? This comes in very handy in your healing. Okay, you're healing around the ring, you're trying to get ready for a trial, but your dog every once in a while kind of drops their head and you want to kind of you want to kind of work through that. You want to kind of frizz that a little bit, okay? So you can still heal around the dogs, the dog goes by another dog. So let's say, let's say this young lady and her dog are sitting right here, I'm healing, and I the first time I go by, the dog looks and then looks back at me, right? Okay? I'm gonna heal around again, I'm gonna give the dog another opportunity. Okay, this time nothing changes. I go by her, the dog doesn't look click I, or, or yes now the dog says oh man that's what you wanted me to do but i'm still healing i don't want the dog to be released yet i still want maybe i want to do it three or four times but i still want to mark the behavior in the behavior does that make sense okay i know this is confusing but i guarantee if you apply this it's really going to help you with clear communication okay so uh capturing behavior so capturing behaviors is a little bit like shaping but it's a little bit different. Um, 
Uh, Sally, is that your bowl? Does. Uh, so, um, do we have a uh, placemat or a? Do you have a plate or a mat or something? Okay, so one of the things that um, and we don't have time to work on everything today, but one of the things I really encourage you guys to do is uh, learn about body mechanics. You guys heard of body mechanics and dog training? Okay, so give me an idea. What have you guys heard? I like this lady. She's absolutely correct. That'll work just fine. Thank you. Set it right there. Okay. In a minute, you're giving me my dog. In a, se in a second. You can sit. Sit. Okay. So what a lot of people don't realize is unless we teach the dog how to move the rear end, the dog really doesn't think about the rear end. Why? Because the rear end doesn't get a reward. What gets the reward? Usually their mouth. Okay. So this is why when we work on healing and positioning, I always tell people the nose is a joystick. If the nose goes right, where's the butt go? left if the nose goes left the butt is a butt go right okay so it's basically a joystick however in healing especially nowadays so you know 20 30 years ago um you could have a really nice trained dog and get really high points however now that dog training is um bigger because akc opened up a whole lot more titles uh, usa just in usa opened up a whole lot more titles there's a lot lot more people doing now competitive obedience nowadays things are more precise we want more crisp obedience we want more precise obedience okay so with that said we had to adapt to find certain ways to get better behaviors can i use your for a minute sally okay sally come over here a little bit please okay stand right there so if Sally's my dog and Sally and I are healing, okay, let's just walk and heal, okay? And I wanna turn left, okay? Basically, in the old days I could bump and I could kinda of push the dog left and the dog could kinda of just kinda of figure it out as, the corner, as we turn the corner, right? Okay, nowadays you get marked down for that. You want to be able to turn left and your dog rotate, okay? However, stay there. If I'm the dog, if I'm Sally's rear end, sorry Sally, we're gonna be friends here. If I'm Sally's rear end, if I'm the if I'm the back end of Sally, and Sally turns, okay, and starts walking that way, the rear end's just gonna kind of cut the corner and kind of catch up, right? We want to teach the dog body mechanics to move the rear end, okay? So I'm getting to a point here. We're we're talking about capturing, okay? So Sally, come act like you're standing on that for me, okay? So. One of the things we do in teaching body mechanics is we teach the dog how just to move the rear end. We start with a, um, a plate. Yeah, basically, we can use a bowl. We can use a good job. <laughs> I would mark that behavior and I reward her, right? Because she did it on her own without me asking. Okay, so uh, we teach the dog to leave the front feet stationary. Oh, the front feet can turn but not walk forward, backwards, or move. And we teach the dog just to move the rear end. So, um... Can I use you? I know you want to do this. Okay, so Sally's a dog. Okay, Jennifer's gonna be handling. Jennifer's gonna come stand in front of Sally. Sally, put your hands out like the, you're the mouth, like your hands are the mouth. Make a mouth with your hands. Okay, Jennifer has food. Okay, so Jennifer is gonna put food in front of the dog's nose. Okay, now Jennifer is just gonna move a little bit around the placemat. Okay, now the moment Sally moved, what would she do? Yes. She would yes the dog. Okay, or now if she was, if she conditioned it, yes. In other words, just like the condition, you could click her. You have to condition the clicker for the dog to understand it, okay? So she would reward at that time. So basically what she's trying to do is she's trying to capture this little thing that the dog did. The dog has no idea what it did. At this point, the dog has, it's like, wait a minute. Okay, I got fed. Okay, then Jennifer's going to do it again. Sally moves again and get fed. Now the dog's thinking, wait a minute. Now the dog's starting to use her brain. What did I just do to get that reward? Okay, she's gonna do it again. Now the dog does it quicker, right? Okay, I think you guys did good. So we're trying to capture that little bit of movement, whether it be movement of the body, whether it be movement of the head, whether it be movement of the feet, okay? When you guys work on sit stays and you're leaving your dog, okay? How the dog sits their feet makes a big difference on whether the dog is gonna stay nicely or the, the picture that you present. So if you want your dog to put its feet together, you want to capture that behavior. Yes, it's kind of back to shaping a little bit, but capturing kind of a different, a different scenario. Does that kind of make sense or am I losing you guys so far? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so bridging behaviors, okay? This is another uh, confusing concept. So I told you earlier the difference between uh, healing and 
uh, and um, finishes, right? Okay. Has anybody ever taught you the concept between the difference between healing and finishes? So this is another big problem we have in, in competitive dog training. We we don't break behaviors down enough. A lot of times people think um, finish is or a heal is the dog gets beside you and then you walk. But in retrospect, it's broken down to way more. Okay. We when a dog does a correct finish, we want the dog's scapula, basically the shoulder blade. There's a there's a vertebrae that runs down the shoulder blade. We want the scapula basically lined up with our leg. We want the dog's head in a certain position, their butt in a certain position. This is a correct finish. It has nothing necessarily to do with healing. However, later we're going to work on healing. Okay, so healing is where the dog is in that finish position, but now the dog learns. Okay, my head's up, and the handler takes a step, and I keep that position. Okay, that's different than healing. Healing is an act of moving. Finish is a is an act of just being beside me in that position. Does that make sense so far? Okay. However, I want to bridge those two behaviors. I want to teach my dog when we're healing, and when I come to a stop, I still want you to be in that finish position. Okay, so before I even started working on movement, I taught the dog the correct finish, the correct placement beside me. Okay, so a lot of times people. Um, let me use it again, I'm sorry. Okay, so a lot of times people will will overdo their training. Okay, let's say she really just wants to work on heel. Okay, so she's standing there. She's like, okay, she knows that usually all heels start in the front position. Okay, she makes me sit. Okay, I sit here, and now she's gonna do a finish. She doesn't know how to do this, so please bless her. Okay, she does a finish, okay, okay, okay. Now she's gonna work on healing, because this is what she really wanted to work on. Well, what did she just do? Her mind was set on just working on healing, but what did she just do there? She just did two more behaviors before she even started working on healing. And the problem is, if you're not working on fronts and finishes, what did you just do with your fronts and finishes? You probably, exactly, you probably accepted a sloppy front and you probably accepted a sloppy finish because your brain was engaged just on healing. So you break it down. So if this was my dog, I mean, you're gonna get my dog for a minute, I'd ask the dog to sit, okay? I would get in position, I would square myself up and from here I'd start working on healing, which we'll talk about in a minute, okay? So I'd say heal, the dog would look up and I'd just feed, dog would look up. so. I didn't have to work on 10 different things before I even worked on the heel. I sat the dog, I got in position, and heel to me is is head just head up. Okay, because I already taught the dog, you think you can that. I already taught the dog a correct finish. Okay, I already taught the dog correct placement. Now I'm teaching the dog correct head mo movement. And when I walk, it's no different. Does that make sense? Okay, so I bridged it. I taught the dog first the correct finish okay maybe for a two or three weeks i worked on that that was correct okay then i sat the dog i worked on heel dog looking up okay when i move the dog's still looking up now i want to bridge those two behaviors so i get beside my dog heel i walk when i stop now the dog understands oh this is what oh now we're doing finish because dad stopped does that make sense i bridge those two behaviors are you sure okay all right, building drive. So engagement and building drive are really co in hand, but they're kind of separate. So if you're very lucky, uh, there's a young man with a Mal that was uh, that we worked with yesterday. His dog's got a ton of drive. You guys ever been around a Malinois? Yeah. Yeah. If your dog's, if a drive is from zero to 10, the Mal probably has a drive of 12 all the time, which is really nice, okay? The reason why this is nice is for training, you don't have to do a lot of drive building. However, they are hard to live with. <laughs> and they may not be your preference a dog. So you as a handler sometimes have to build drive, okay? Either you have to pick what your dog's highest drive is, whether it be toy, food, usually those are the two objects. Um, I don't know if there's anything really else. I guess everything, if it's not eating, it falls under toy, right? So you have to figure out, is toy the highest drive or is food the highest drive? So a lot of people say, well, why can't I just pet my dog? Why can't I just tell the dog, good boy? Well, for a couple different reasons. One, how often do you tell your dog it's a good boy or girl? Probably every day, right? If my dog comes over, he brings me, oh, good job, okay? I, I talk to him and say, good boy, okay, whatever it is. It's equivalent of having children, and every day you give your child $100. Just every day, just give your child $100. When he turns 18 and you want him to ask to get a job, what do you think the chances of getting a job is? Yeah, no way, I get it all the time, 
okay? So this is one of the reasons why just praising your dog is not necessarily a good way of rewarding or necessarily building drive. So you have to figure out what is your dog's strength, food or toy? And then you take that and you try to build on it. It's really nice if you have a dog that is equal in both. If you have a dog that's really nice food drive, or you have, if you have a dog that is really a nice toy drive, and they're both nice, it's really good because in IPO, we have to do tracking. We teach tracking with food. Without food drive, it's very, very difficult to teach the dog tracking, okay? Um, does, when we use food, or sorry, when we use toys for training, it's, it's sometimes it's a little difficult. It slows our learning curve down. Can anybody tell me why? Do what? She's almost got it. It's not necessarily giving the reward to the dog. That we can give quickly, but it's engaging and then it's getting the toy back, setting the dog up for the behavior again, and then do it again. If I can, if I'm teaching my dog finishes, and if I can teach my dog uh, ten finishes in a two-minute time period, like do them really quickly, the dog's going to learn it way quicker. If I do ten finishes in a five-minute time period, now my dog is going to learn slower. Okay, so I want the dog to try to learn the behavior quicker. However, some dogs um, don't have a ton of food drive and can't go long distance with, with food, and so their toy comes in handy. So you have to figure out what your dog's highest drive is, and you have to, sometimes we have to learn to develop it. Um, can I use you again? Sorry. So let's say you have a dog that has moderate food drive. So food drive is the one thing that if your dog genetically does not have a ton of, you can sometimes create it better Toy drive, prey drive, sometimes it's just genetics. If you if you rescue a dog that just does not, let's say you rescue the dog and the person spent a year telling the dog, no, don't chase that, no, don't chase that, okay? And you got the dog, yes, sometimes you can come along and say, okay, you can bring that drive back out because it's genetically there, but if your dog genetically just does not have it, it's extremely difficult, okay? So one of the things we do to build food drive is a little bit of separation anxiety, yes, we can withhold food, everybody knows that. If you withhold your dog's food the morning of or the night of, your dog's a little hungry. However, some dogs are like, yeah, I know the food's coming, why should I do that? So sometimes we can do a little bit of drive building game where let's say Rebecca's holding my puppy, okay? I come up to the puppy and I show the puppy food and I just run away a little bit and I wait. My puppy's like, wait a minute, why did you run away? I really want that food. So the moment the dog barks or shows me any excitement, boom, I go back and I feed the dog, right? And now I run away this way, okay? Now the dog just figured out, wait a minute. Last time I barked or showed him some energy, he came and fed me. Boom, I run up and I feed him, okay? Now go away. Now the moment I leave, now what's the dog gonna do? All right, man, I know what to do. Yes, we are kind of creating a bad problem of barking sometimes, however, Dogs bark when they're happy. Dogs bark to communicate. Dogs bark when they, they want to tell us something, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing, unless you have Zito, which whines and he leaks, and we'll, we'll, we can address that another time. But um, but I want the dog to show me his drive. So by doing this little game, I'm increasing, I'm not necessarily genetically increasing the, the food drive, but I'm taking what he's giving me, and I'm kind of adding to it now. The dog's like, oh, I want to do this. Thank you so much. Okay, so, yes? You know, stop a leaky dog. Change his gasket. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I like that. That's a good idea. So the type of food we use can make a difference. So yes, the, a higher value food can excite the dog more or lower the drive, depending on which way we go. Um, sometimes the food actually dictates our learning curve. If my dog does something right and I want to reward him for it and I feed him this big crunchy biscuit and it takes him 30 seconds to digest it and then I want to do it again, what happened to my learning curve now? Yep, decrease. Now, the contrary to the rule, we did a little tracking with the um, young man with the Malawat, and I, he brought kibble. I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be hard. The dog's going to sit there and chew. Holy cow, the dog was like a little vacuum. It didn't really care. It just slopped it down. So he kind of made a, a contrary to the rule. However, most of the time we want soft, malleable food. The dog bites once, and dog eats and says, ooh, I want to do that again. Um, that's why usually we use hot dogs, cheese. Um, I used to use hot dogs before I tried training dogs. Now I hate hot dogs because I have to put them in my mouth. A lot of my training, I'm spitting food out my dog's mouth. It's just something I do. Um, one of the problems with that is, well, is a little side note here. Did you notice when my dog's healing, he was really crooked? Okay, a couple different reasons. One, we'll talk about positioning a little bit later, but one, because of his positioning, I have all this metal in my way. In order to look at my face, he has to kind of wrap around. Okay, there's nothing I can do about it. If my arms work like yours, I'd have a very nice healing dog. It just 
It doesn't work that way. And the other reason why a lot of times I'm spitting food out my mouth, I'm just constantly spitting food out my mouth, of course, so he wants to look at my face. So the more I do, the more he, he turns. Every trial I get marked down with it. There, with my puppy, I'm doing a couple little different things differently this time. Um, one of the things I do with my puppy, instead of necessarily looking at my face and coming up here where this little camera is, I'm actually teaching the dog to touch the back of my arm. I have these all these bruises on the back of my arm. Why? Because the puppy has learned to push me, push, 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 push. That's helped my dog be a little bit straighter. He's still a little bit crooked, but it's really helping. And one of the other things I do is I will have a tug. I know it seems weird. I will put a tug in my teeth, and I'll have somebody with a long line out that way. I'll be healing the dog, and when I release the dog, they'll yank the toy out that way. Okay? So the reason why we do this is, now what is the muscle memory? Where's the toy going? Out that way. Where's his muscle memory now? Coming this way, right? So by the toy going out that way, now it's helping him understand, oh, the toy's gonna go out that way. The problem is, of course, I'm not gonna have somebody there all the time. Um, it's just one of those things I have to accept. I hate it. I hate it, hate it, hate it, but I have to accept it. And I've had I've had many trainers, oh, you can do this and fix it, you can do this and fix it. And I have tried to fix it, but I understand the mechanics. Unless you're in a chair, it's very hard to understand the mechanics, okay? A little tidbit there. Uh, so the release from the behavior, release is extremely important. One of the problems we have a lot of times is we overtrain our dogs, or our dogs are always thinking they're in training mode. Okay, one of the things I'm really going to push with all you guys today when I work with your dogs is, and I was talking to Sarah about this, I'm going to hopefully get your dogs out each least a, a number of times, okay? We're going to train a little bit, put the dog up. Train, train a little bit, put the dog up, okay? This is really important for a couple different reasons. One, we don't want to overtrain the dog. We don't want to ask too much too soon from the dog. We want lessons to be short and compact. But a lot of times the dog, um, we're asking the dog to do something and we really haven't properly released the dog. The dog doesn't understand that, oh, hey, I'm done with that, okay? A good example is this. If a club member comes out and let's say they're working on downs with their dog, okay? And they we're working on downs, the dog's doing really good. They release the dog. Now one of the club members comes over and starts asking him how their week was and the dog's kind of still laying there. Maybe the dog chose to lay down or maybe maybe they just kind of told the dog to down and the day start talking to the person and the dog kind of gets up and you know moves around and they don't fix it. But wait a minute. They just worked on the long down with their dog, but now they disengage from their dog talking. They put their dog in a down. Why? Because they just want the dog to be stationary. The dog blew the down. So what mixed signals do we send the dog? So there's always, anytime we ask the dog to do something, it, whether it be sit, down, stay, what, anything, anything, anytime we ask the dog for behavior, it's the start of a behavior. But there has to be an end to the behavior. It's not like kisses, asking your dog to give kisses. If you ask your dog to give kisses, do you really have to free your dog from kissing you? No, you just want the dog to give you a couple kisses and it can choose when not to. However, anytime you ask the dog a behavior that you've taught them, there has to be a release. If not, then the dog starts using their own brain and saying, oh, I'm gonna just start releasing myself. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so, Question. yes. Do you use a separate, okay, like uh, the dog's done the behavior, you reward it and say, okay, take a break, yet you're still wanting a little bit of engagement versus, okay, we're done. Okay, so that's a really good point. So. Is engagement a command we put to the dog? No. I've never walked up to my dog and said, engage, <laughs> right? Engage, engagement is a frame of mind. It's an attitude, it's a relationship. That's a big word. It's a relationship with you and your dog, okay? It's not a command. So technically, if, she, if she's working on sit with her dog, her dog sits, she releases her dog, and then her dog says, oh, I wanna play with you, and she starts playing with her dog, that's perfectly fine. She doesn't necessarily have to release the dog from playing. Why? Because in playing is not a command. Playing is not a behavior that we put on command. Yes, it is a behavior sometimes if you're teaching your dog different ways to play. Like me with my dog, uh, with my dogs, I want to teach the dog to grip and pull. They bite and they pull. Pull, 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 pull. I want to teach the dog always to pull. One of the reasons is in protection sports, we want the dog to always have a nice firm grip. We want the dog to grip and then we want the dog to fight. We start teaching us as puppies. So anytime my dog is to play with anything, it's grip and it's pull, it's grip and it's pull. However, I haven't put a command to the engagement. Yes, I am encouraging him to pull. Yes, I can put a command to it. Now, that is contrary to the rule. If I am tugging with my dog and I'm teaching him pull, 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 and the dog's pulling back, 
I will then free him and I'll do something else so he gets out of the pull so he doesn't have to think he keeps pulling. Because if I just allow him pull, 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 and then allow him to stop pulling and kind of lay down and chew it, well, now what am I doing to my pulling behavior that I taught the dog? Does that make sense? So really good question there. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about is throwing the dog a party. Okay, you guys ever heard this concept, throwing your dog a party? Okay. Give me an overview of what throwing a dog a party means to you. Okay, put that in a science point of view. Uh, <laughs> give me, give me an example of what you do with your dog. Praise, high praise, lots of extra praise. Okay, that so, cool. okay, uh, I'm looking for a little bit more technical uh, term here. Endorphins? So, do what? Endorphins? Uh, not quite. So, um, can I use you? Okay, so let's go back. I'm gonna be her dog, okay? She's going to heal me past these people here, okay? So, we're healing along. Okay, now remember, I'm young and healing. She's only, she's only kind of started working on this, okay? So I, I go past these people, I'm looking, and then I look back, and she rewards me, she feeds me, right? Okay, no, just do, do me a favor, feed me what, okay? Okay, she, we go back, go past these people, I look, come back, she feeds me, yes! Because that's what she wants me to do, right? Okay, now we go around again, okay? She's like thinking, okay, last time the dog looked, this time the dog didn't look, or this time maybe the dog's not gonna look, I don't look this time, and boom, she throws me a huge party, okay? She releases me and feeds me like 10 treats. What am I going to remember more? Now, we wanna reward the dog for going past this young lady and making an effort for not looking because the dog could have done 10 things. The dog could have ran off and sniffed her. The dog could have jumped on her. The dog could have bit her in the leg, whatever the case is. But the dog could have offered different, but the dog still stayed in the heel. And I would want a reward for that. But then I'm going to give the dog an opportunity. Now the dog didn't even look. Man, the dog did something really great. Okay? So at that point, I feed the dog a party. Ask yourself this. If your boss came up to you, okay, let's, and if you guys work or have work, and your boss comes up to you and puts $100 on your desk and just walks away or puts it in your locker or whatever, gives you just an extra $100, what would your brain do? Yeah, <laughs> your brain might be looking, hey, what did I do? But your brain would say, wait a minute, what did I do? But I want to do it again. Then you would start offering, the, trying to figure out what the behavior you did in order to get that $100, okay? The dog is much the same way. The dog says, wait a minute, when I went past her the first time, I looked, but then I got rewarded for coming back. But then wait a minute, when I went past her and I didn't look at all, man, then I got the 100 bucks, okay? So we call it throwing the dog a party. So here's a little concept. If you have 10 treats in your hand and you hold your hand out, okay, that's one treat to your dog. Why? Because the dog opens up the mouth and that's gone. So when you throw your dog a party, it's repetitive, at least one or two seconds in between each one. Feed, 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 feed. Now the dog's like, oh man, I got this huge reward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I went through the board here. Any questions so far? Are your minds fried yet? Yes. Yes. And <laughs> yes. With like using a cooker, I have one that has two different. Sounds. That perfectly works fine too. So you can use one as to mark the behavior and one to be the release. You got it. Okay. She's absolutely correct. Yes. So uh, going back to the capturing behavior, or it was the one. It wasn't capturing, but it was very similar. Um, I forget what word you used. Essentially, it was like uh, free shaping or sh shaping. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, is it any behavior? So if I'm <coughs> sitting there and I have three pieces of cheese and they come up and they lie down and it's a correct lie down, is that like do I just give a reward because they did a correct lie down? Yes. Okay. But the dog is offering without you initiating it. So it could be anything. They could, they it could be anything. Finish, they could but let's say you don't want that. Let's say let's say the dog is offering too many down. Like you're trying to work on sit during the week, but your dogs keep downing. You ignore it. Okay. However, you're not confusing your dog later. Because you're not really working on down, you're you're choosing to to mark that behavior because the dog did correctly, but you're not necessarily in training mode. So you don't have to release the dog. You don't have to you don't have to uh, you know um, help the dog be straight or anything like that. Okay. If the dog downs with a crooked, just ignore him. If the dog then downs and they're straight, all right, that's what I really want you to do. Because every time the dog comes to you, every time the dog maybe interacts with you, it could be a training opportunity. 
you. Not necessarily because I didn't initiate it. I didn't ask the dog to down. Okay. What you're saying is kind of correct. So they start associating the down with with that correct behavior. But then again, if you do that, now you have to free the dog. Now you're making a training session out of it. So um, if you're working, let's say you go out and you're getting like, okay, I'm training my dog. Okay. And you go out and you're working on downs with the dog and the dog does offer the down and you're ready to train and you're set up to train, then you are good down. You can do that. But if you're just, if you're just working, do it cleaning in your house, you're cleaning your house. And for some reason you can't get eye contact out of your dog and you've got the mop in your hand, you're mopping. And all of a sudden the dog comes up and gives you eye contact. Yes. Good job. Because what happens if you ignore it? Now later when you're trying to get it, the dog's going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> Earlier I gave it to you. You didn't even want it. Now you want it? Okay, this is kind of confusing. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Uh, on that, would you say yes? Like, uh, yes, I would, yes, I would definitely mark it. Here's, yes, I'd still mark it. I don't necessarily need a release from it. I would mark it, and then I would feed. I, wouldn't, I, don't, I want you guys to make sure you're not marking and feeding. You're not marking and feeding. I know this is... And then feed. Yes, the, the, the reward. You did the behavior, but wait for the reward to come. Not, you did the behavior, now you can just go crazy. Okay? You can, yeah, if you don't have food, but you can, yeah, you can mark it. No, yeah, you don't have to run to the refrigerator because if you run to the refrigerator, by then what happens? It's too late. Yeah, so one of the things I do with my puppy is if I am, let's say I'm watching a movie and the puppy comes over, one of the things like for my front, um, I get really technical in my front. So first I work on head positioning, then I work on butt positioning, then I work on where to be in front of me, and then I try to put all three together. Okay. So if he comes over and he nudges me with his with his uh, nose and my stomach, I jump back. What did you do? Okay. I acknowledge it. I reward him for it because he got me to do something. Right. And then now he likes it. Now next time I do a front, he's like, oh man, if I offer that head positioning and put it right there, I can get dad to react. So. I'm very animated, okay? This is one of the reasons I'm 41 and not married, okay? Because I'm really good with dogs because I'm really nutty. And one of the reasons I'm really nutty is because I want to have a relationship with my dog. I want to have my dog say, oh man, I want to give dad something. Man, if I come over and nudge him with my nose or if I give my dog eye contact, he's gonna come alive, he's gonna do things with me, okay? So then when I'm in a stressful situation, and the dog is like, okay, dad, I'm kind of stressed here, but I'll give you some more attention. I know dad's going to back me up by acknowledging and help me through again. That's okay. It's a relationship building skill. Okay, really good questions. Okay, anything else so far? Back to the double yes. Sorry, I was checking Okay. That's perfectly fine. So the, here's the one comment I would comment on that. How often do you tell him good? It depends on what I'm doing. With his engagement and watching me, if I'm trying to go further, I'll say it several times. Okay. So uh, I, I know Sally very well. and we're, Her and I are really good friends, so I can pick on her a little bit here. Um, I, I almost guarantee Sally says good way too much. And if good is said, oh, good job. You did go, oh, good job. Oh, good. Okay. Now what happens to good? We've kind of destroyed it a little bit. It's really not necessarily a marker. Now, if she's using good in order to bring in some drive, to bring in some engagement, that's fine. But I, I would make sure you really clarify the difference between a marker word and, and let's say, engagement word. Well, I use it letting him know he's doing the right thing, keep doing it. In my mind, that's what I'm using it for. Okay, so are you using yes as a release? Yes. So hold on. So your yes is a release from the behavior. Yes. Okay. And your good is a mark of behavior. I guess yeah. No, that's so. Well, I'm gonna pick on her. But if she, if I can't answer, the, if she can't firmly answer this question without her dog, then what? Then. Okay, but I'm, I'm picking on her for a minute because what happens is the moment we get in that moment and we're, oh my gosh, and we don't know exactly what our communication is, now what happens to the dog? The dog's like, okay, I'm all confused. So really, like... Well, I know it. You're just questioning me, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, she, she knows what you've been... But I'm picking on... But make sure that you guys really... Uh, the, the point here I want to make, I'm not trying to pick on Sally. Um, no, the point I really want to make is make sure things are defined. There's no gray area. Okay. Yes means I stay in the behavior, but you're marking the behavior. Free means I'm out of the behavior, 
double yes means, okay, there's a reward coming, um, but I don't run off and pee on a tree. You know, whatever the case is, whatever, whatever language that you guys come up with, make sure it's always the same. Because the moment you start getting upset at your dog, oh, why are you understanding me? You need to question yourself and say, did you properly teach this? And is there, did you create gray areas? And the dog's just firmly not understanding what you want from them. Okay? So if that system works for her, like my, I have kind of a variation that works for me too. If I click, 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 yes, click, click, then my dog will stay in a heel with me. But if I click once, then she gets the treat, and then we have to like build it again. So if I do that, like you're good, 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 good and then treat her. That works for me. Or are you telling me I should change all that? So is your, are you relying on your click in order to keep the dog in the behavior? Is a click now become a lure? Okay. So this, I, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. So this is where we don't want to use a clicker like this. Basically, now the clicker has become a crutch. Instead of the dog offering now the behavior, now she's having to rely on the clicker in order to remind the dog, hey, i got to keep my head up. And the moment she goes in the ring and she doesn't have the clicker and the reminder is not there, now what happens? So I really would probably not use the clicker like that. So if you, I'm sorry, this is just my personal opinion. Like I said, don't take what I, yeah, don't take what I say, guys, as fact. You guys need to question, question, question. One of the worst things I hate is working with somebody and they say, oh my gosh, this person told me to do it this way, and so I'm gonna do it that way. But why? Well, I don't know. They said to do it. I don't want you guys to do that. I really want you guys to question everything I say. And then call me up and say, hey, I talked to 10 other people. They said you shouldn't do it that way. And explain to me why, because so I can learn. Dog training is about a revolving learning door. We're always learning. I am learning from you guys right here. You guys don't realize, but I'm learning from you. Every dog I work with, I'm learning either how to do it correctly or how not to do it correctly. Okay? And I learn from you guys. You guys can learn from other people else. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. So this is a very Uh -huh. So my experience with treats is really limited, um, and I've always felt like when I hold up a treat and they start offering me behaviors to try to get that treat, I feel like they're not engaging with me, it's not personal, they just want that treat, and mm. I just feel like there's a disconnect, and I'm trying to reconcile what I'm learning, and I see these results, and I want those, but with that feeling of like, you don't even care about me, you just want this treat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really, really good question. So this is one of the things that... Um, Yes. Maybe this time if there's a, you, you want to do the definition between bribery and reward. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, and Sarah went into it a little bit with me on Wednesday, and I really liked, like, I felt like I got a taste of kind of that. Okay. So I'm going to explain to you kind of how I explain it, and then if I don't cover it, we can talk about it together a little bit. So when I teach a basic obedience class, this is one of the hardest things um, I have to get through to people because who here has seen Caesar Milan? Okay, Caesar Milan knows jack shit about dog training. I'm sorry to say. Okay, what he knows, no, no, hold on. But let's but let's understand. It's really easy to pick on other trainers, but let's try to understand why. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm not a scientist. I've never gone to college. I don't want to ever pitch myself what I'm not. However, there's a new, there's a lot of new studies that realize, and it is why this we haven't realized this sooner makes no sense. But when I explain this to you, you're gonna have a light bulb moment. But the whole pack mentality is kind of out the window, right? Dogs are not pack animals. Ask yourself this: How many? If we have a Chihuahua in front of us, how many generations back did that Chihuahua have to be in a pack in order to go find food, catch food, and eat food? I'm thinking probably 50, right? Okay, that's like me being um, John Elway's son and the Denver Broncos saying, hey, because you're John Elway's son, we're going to recruit you and we're going to, you know, we're, you're going to come play for us just because I'm his son. Okay, the same philosophy applies. The, 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 this genetics. Now, yes, maybe dogs come from wolves. You know, it may be, maybe the original wolves and this whole pack mentality 100 years ago or 200 years ago, whenever the dog started, depending on the breed, made sense but nowadays our dogs don't have to be in packs in order to survive they don't have this pecking order they don't have this okay so compulsion based training is really where this came about where 
in the old days, um, what we realized is the more force we put on the animal, the more the brain physically shuts down. A lot of people don't realize. Um, it's, we see the same thing in children. Um, if we have a child and we're trying to teach the child a mathematical problem and they don't understand the problem, and the more frustrated we get, the more the brain shuts down. The brain just goes in, and basically what the brain does, it goes in protection mode. The brain says, I don't know what's happening. I want to avoid it. I got to deal with this somehow, so I'm going to, like, you know, not, okay? So if we go back to fear mentality with dog training, which Cesar Milan does, if, you ever, if you're not sure about this, then watch 10 episodes and see if you ever see him use treats or a toy or any kind of reward, okay? But it's marketing, which I'll talk about in a minute. So if we start putting compulsion on the dog like we did in the old school days, Okay, the dog's brain shuts down. Okay, so there's a, tr um, I don't know his name. I, you guys probably know his name. There's a guy 20 years ago that used to sell videotapes um, when videotapes were out about dog training. And one of, the, one of the first videos I saw was him is teaching this um, Borzor, I don't know, this big, tall, fluffy dog how to heal. And basically what he'd do is he'd have a long line on the dog and a prong collar, and he would walk in a square. And every time he walked in the square, he'd yank the dog neck. Okay, he'd yank the dog, yank the dog. I guarantee I could get your dog to heal like that and very, very quick. You can, you can teach the dog to heal that way. Is it really healing? No, because the dog's not really learning a behavior. They're just learning out of fear, a, a fearful behavior, but they're reasoning to say, okay, uh, forget, this is not training. I just want to stay next to him because that's a safe spot. So then dolphin training started coming in where we realized that in order to get a dolphin, you can't put a prong collar on a dolphin, right? So then conditioning behavior started, I think, and I don't know for sure, but my understanding it started with dolphins where they started using clicker and conditioning behavior with dolphins in order to teach behaviors. And then somebody got the idea, wait a minute, what if we apply this concept to dog training and say, okay, does this work for dogs? And then people started realizing, oh, wait a minute, you get much better results. Now, the problem is, if you watch Cesar Milan, in a 30 minute episode, he can get these great results. We live in a society where we want instant gratification, right? This is why cell phones are so important. We want to be able to just pick up the phone and order a pizza. We want to be able to do this and we want instant gratification. So a dog trainer came along and started showing people that they could have instant gratification. Why go to me and take a six week course when you can turn a TV show on and get results in 30 minutes and just do what Caesar does, okay? Positive reinforcement takes time. You guys probably already know this. It takes weeks, months, sometimes years, okay? Where negative reinforcement, yes, you can get results, but are they really results? When what are you doing to your relationship? Now, if you have a pet dog, some, I'm not saying use negative reinforcement, but sometimes, yes, you can do use negative reinforcement and be okay because you don't mind if you walk in your door and your dog cowers and drops its head. Why? Because it's not jumping up on you and you are you don't really care, right? But for you guys who are competing, you take that dog into the ring that does that, one, people are going to look at you, what kind of training are you doing? Two, you're probably not going to get very good points. So then positive reinforcement comes along. So now we come up to, okay, what's the difference between bribery and using a food motivation? Raise your hand if you guys ever played a slot machine. Okay, I think there's a casino actually right down the road, right? Okay, so how does the slot machine train us? How does it train us? Nope, before that. Okay, it engages us, okay? So, have you guys ever been to Reno or Las Vegas? So, Reno, kind of, almost, he's almost there. But before even that, even before that happens, okay? So when you come into Reno, there's a big hill when you come into Reno. The moment you come over that hill, the moment you start seeing big lights, right? Okay, those lights have conditioned your brain. Those lights mean fun, okay? When we go to the carnival, what do we see at night? We see lights. We see sounds. Our brain is already saying, oh man, we're going to have fun, okay? So the moment we come into Reno, we're seeing lights, or we're seeing sounds, or we're seeing big things, right? Okay, plus there's this energy, and we think, all right, we're going we're gonna to win money. So what we do is we go to a machine, and we lie to ourselves. We sit down the machine and say, okay, I'm going to only spend $50. That's all I'm going to do, because we always, everybody puts budgets, right? We always think we have a budget until we dig out the bank card, but we always have a budget. So we sit down, and we start feeding that machine, and we start pulling that lever. Now, you've got to think. Some idiot just trained us. We're sitting there, we're wasting three hours of our life and we're sitting there pulling a lever, plus we're smoking and drinking at the same, at the same time, so we're really killing ourselves. And all of a sudden at $45, what happens? We win, right? All, and what happens when we win? Does a, little, does a little ticket come out and say, okay, go take your 
change up, you know, go take the ticket and get your, you know, money. Nope. What happens is lights go off, coins fall down. Everybody look, oh man, look what it, and we get excited. Our brain starts conditioning. Oh man, look, I just won. But what happens is we forgot something. We forgot that one, we lost three hours of our life for $45. We spent $45 in order to get $10. Not very good mathematics, right? However, we just got conditioned to sit there and pull, do all that work and spend that money for a little bit of behavior, for a little bit of reward, okay? So in dog training, it's basically, if you got, if you, if you sat down at, at a machine and every time you pulled that lever, money came out, would you ever leave that machine? It's called an ATM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but your, but your ATM, your ATM runs out really, right? <laughs> okay, let's get back to the concept here. If you pull, if you pull that lever and you win every time, would you ever leave the machine? Okay, you would not leave that machine, okay? However, let's say let's say for a month, you pull that lever, and every time you pull that lever, you win, you win, you win. All of a sudden, you pull the lever one day, and nothing comes out. Do you leave the machine and go to another machine? No. I wouldn't. I keep pulling the lever, right? So, so you sit there, and maybe for a couple days, you sit there and pull the lever. All of a sudden, after a couple days, boom, you start winning again. What had happened to your brain? Wait a minute, you'll log that in your brain. You don't really think about the days that you, you know, that you lost money. You're just thinking, man, all that money I won, right? So now, one day after a couple of days of pulling the lever, now you stop winning for a month. Would you walk away from the machine? I sure wouldn't, because I made the in your mind. You think, oh man, I won all those times. I I made ten thousand dollars. Okay, I'd go a month without it. Kind of see where we're going here? So this is where engagement reward over bribery, okay? Bribery would be, actually here's a really good example. We, we had to bribe my puppy last night, okay? What happened, and you saw that, okay? We'll talk about it. So last night um, we got my puppy out and I had, uh, Co, what's his name? Co, Co do a little rag work with my puppy, okay? And he's doing really good, he's tugging, he's tugging. And we go to carry the rag off the sleeve or off the field, and he slips his collar. And the puppy says, "Wait a minute, there's a van. Ooh, there's that fun field. What do you think the puppy did? The puppy r takes his toy and runs out to the middle of the field. Okay. Now the puppy has a hundred dollars right there on the ground because he had to fight to get that hundred dollars. Okay. I was a fart in the wind to him. I never even tried to call him. I even told other people. You can. I think Sarah or somebody started kind of walking towards him. I'm like, don't do it." Because the moment you get towards him, boom, he's taking off, okay? What did we have to do to get him back? We had to, no, we had to bribe him. Yeah, we, we started to walk up, he, screw you. He knows that we're probably not gonna leave him. And plus, it's a higher value of being in the car, of being out in the field to be in the car. So what did we have to do? We had to go get a flirt pole, which is a higher value than the tug he had. He dropped that tug and, and started chasing the flirt pole. That's bribery. It's not engagement necessary. That's bribery. We had to bribe him. There was no other way we could have got him, honestly. Yes, we probably could have waited hours. It's getting dark, maybe. Um, we could have tossed food at him, but he's learned that game. The, the puppies suck. I hate puppies so much. I, I always want to start a business where I just raise puppies for people because I want somebody to raise my puppy, but I don't trust anybody because we spend so much time screwing puppies up, and then all of a sudden now when their brain kicks in, now we go to training, and the puppy's like, wait a minute. Wait, this is not what you taught me the first year of my life. So... Do you understand kind of the difference? Especially that example we saw last night. That's bribery. So engagement is basically sitting down at that machine. Every time we pull that lever, we're winning. And that's what we do with our dog. So I can't tell you how long to engage with your dog. I can't tell you if you need to do this with a day or for a year or a week. or, or You have to decide as a handler. And there's no, like, no point I can tell you, okay, now the dog is ready just to stop engage, do less engage and more training. One of the ways I do tell people is this, start doing a synopsis of, of your training and location. So I get this all the time. You guys probably already realize this. Our dogs are perfect at home, right? My dog doesn't do that at home. I hear that all the time. My dog doesn't do this at home. My dog doesn't do this at home. Okay, well, what good is if your dog doesn't do it out of the house, that if your dog does it at home. Okay, so the idea is for the dog, you know, basically you'd be able to go somewhere, take your dog into a ring, 
that has lots of stresses, lots of egg, you know, lots of things going on, and the dog offer you the same behavior it does at home. Okay, so you guys need to start real taking your dog to different locations and seeing their level of engagement. So let's say you work on engagement uh, in your house for a good two or three weeks. Boom, dogs engaged, doing really good. Okay, take your dog down to the park. Okay, get your dog out, do a little engagement. So see how much engagement your dog is giving you outside of your house. So at home, let's say your dog gives you 95% of his engagement. Let's say you know, 100% is just a dog absolutely crazy, won't, won't, eat, won't even eat, but it wants to look at you and give you all of its drive and just you're its whole world, okay? When you take it to a park, let's say the dog gives you 30%, okay? Is it really ready to go to the park? Probably not. So what you do is you go from your living room to your front yard, okay? You get into your front yard, you do the engagement, you're playing in the front yard, now the dog's giving you at least like 85 to 90% in your front yard. Okay, after a couple weeks or a day or whatever, now bring the dog to the park. Now the dog is giving you 65 to 70% in the park. Now that's telling you, okay, my engagement's doing better. Okay? Now the moment you start shaping them, when we start taking from your bank account, you got to be careful that you're depositing. So at no time will I ever stop depositing my dog's bank account. It never stops. Engagement never stops. As long as I'm training, I'm always kind of working on engagement. I'm always working on, on finding new ways. And sometimes that's what it takes, finding new ways to get your dogs engaged. One of the things that we realize is dogs get tired of eating the same treats all the time. So I try to vary my treats. I feed my dog a raw diet. And the other day I got his uh, raw diet out. It is frozen a little bit, cut into squares. Um, I didn't bring it with me. I have this um, this dowel that's about three feet long, or about two feet long, has a uh, measuring cup on the end. I put that in my teeth. And that's actually how I work on positioning. I get my dog, because the, the dowel now sticks away from me, the dog looks straight up and I reward the dog, okay? Um, I converted my garage, I have these horse stall mats in my garage, I converted my garage to a little training area. So I can go right into the little training area and work on this with him. So I got his dog food out, which he goes absolutely nuts for his raw food, right? Okay, I cut that up, why? Because he's getting kind of tired of hot dogs and cheese. Man, the moment I got that out and started training with that, his engagement went through the roof. He's almost too crazy. I'm like, all right, so now I kind of vary it a little bit. Um, I also have a, you can't see it, I didn't um, bring it with me, it's in the car, but I have a tug that's on a spring. I love to invent things. I've invented many things over my lifetime, dog toys, little things like that. Um, I invented, uh, I don't mar not marketing or anything like that for, for myself, basically a tug that's on a spring because Zito's 80 pounds and when he shakes, he just breaks my chair apart. You know, <laughs> you try to explain to your insurance company that your chair got broke by the dog and it's really hard to get things covered, right? So I came up with this little thing that's on a spring. Dog can pull all day long, okay? It's engaging to him. We play with it. I have somebody, I'll have somebody hold him and I'll take the tug and I'll tease him a little bit and then I'll do a little tug. Sometimes I get the dog out, tease him a little bit, put the dog up. And I do that just for a training period, like for a training day. Next day, the dog comes out. He's like, oh man, I'm pissed off now. Last week, you didn't get me. You didn't let me have that. I really want to get that out. Now where's the engagement? It goes to the roof, okay? So kind of going back to when it's time to start shaping outside of your house and your engagement level also depends on your dog's age and maturity. Age and maturity, I think we kind of talked about this already. It's really, really important. You know, if you have a big dog, by the time the dog's a year old, the body is usually the size, like a shepherd, usually they're the height of what they're going to be like by, by a year, which, you know, my puppies will build a little bit of a chunk. But we have to remind ourselves that the brain is still very immature and we have to tailor our training to our brain, okay? So what time is it? Okay. Okay, so any questions so far before we get your dogs out? Okay, do we have a list of people in order to go? Um, I think we'll just start here and go. Okay, so Here's a couple suggestions, and what we're gonna work on, you guys can work on anywhere. If you guys are getting ready for a trial, do the same thing. Picture this as you're getting ready to go in a ring, okay? So anytime you go to a new location, get your dog out, bring the potty, okay? If you're an AKC, if your dog urinates or defecates in the ring, you're out. If it's uh, if you're an IPO, sometimes you can get away with it be depending on the judge, but if you're an IPO, it really sucks because if your dog is a female and urinates on the field, it ruins it for everybody else. So if your dogs are not used to traveling and um, conditioned to, you know, potting, you know what, use as a training exercise. Go somewhere, get your dog out of the crate, 
walk them around. If they don't go, put them up. Read on your phone for a little while, your newspaper. Okay, get the dog back out. Wait, walk them around. When they potty, boom, go into its engagement. So now the dog's learning. No fun begins unless I urinate or defecate. Okay, that way when you go to a trial and you're an hour before you go in the ring, you need to let the dog release themselves. The dog knows I need to do this or no fun happens, okay? You've got to start conditioning. The other thing you guys start doing is, we talked about this already, desensitize the dog to the room, okay? This is, there's a couple things that are different about this room. Um, we have to look at the slick floor. So if you guys notice, when you look towards the door, you can see the reflection, right? This to the dog is weird. If you look towards this door, you can see the light coming through. Some dogs are really worried about that. Some dogs with the slick floor, they're really worried about that. These lights aren't really bright, okay? Dogs don't see very well, okay? You gotta keep all these little things in mind. So if you take your dog out and you move around a little bit and you get them used to things, that helps, okay? One of the other things they guys do is the moment you guys go anywhere, yes, desensitize the dog and then put them away, then get them out and go right into some engagement. I don't care if you're at an AKC event. You know, get your dog out, walk them around, desensitize them, put them up. Then get them out a little bit later, boom, get them out, play, engage. Do that three or four times. I'll do that before a trial, three or four times in the parking lot. And then the moment I'm up and I go get my dog, is he thinking, ugh, we gotta go in the ring or we gotta go to the trial. Oh no, my dad, the dad's gonna play with me because he just did it three or four times, right? I just conditioned him to think that we're not gonna go do a trial that's 15 minutes and boring. We're gonna go do playing. Oh, okay, I'll heal for you a while because I know that playing coming. Does that make sense? Okay, so the other thing is when Sally's getting ready, you are not gonna solve problems today. Let me say this again. You are not going to solve problems today. I want to teach you how to solve problems throughout the next years of your dog's life, but you are not going to fix problems today. Now, yes, you may get results, and I hope we get results, but don't think that your dog is fixed, okay? I want you to learn it more than your dog. When I teach a basic obedience class, I really throw my clients off. I tell them, I don't care if your dog does really good or not. And they're like, wait a minute. I said, I want you to do good. I want you to learn it because you're the handler. You're working with your dog on a daily basis, okay? Same thing applies with your dogs here, okay? So I want you to be thinking, let's, let's, I'd like to get each dog, how many dogs do we have? Do we have 11 or 12? Um, yes. Okay, so. Good answer. And, and are we going until five? Okay, so my goal is I'd like to I'd like to be ambitious and at least get each dog out at least three to four times. Uh, we can get a couple dogs out, then I think we're breaking for lunch, and then. Um, but I'd like to, the reason being is, if we get the dog out, the dog offers a good behavior. We're not going to keep doing it. What are we going to do? We're going to put the dog up. Why? Because and this is the other thing. So I know I get a little tangent here, but a lot of times the dog does really good. Oh, what do we do? We want to do it again, and we want to do it again, and we want to do it again. Yes, there's sometimes that you want to do it maybe a couple multiple times, but sometimes don't overdo it. And don't work on 10 behaviors in one training session. I'm happy. If I get my dog out, I do a couple finishes, that's it. Go get a beer. You know, watch a movie. After the movie and beer, hey, I get the dog back out, I do another, you know, something else, or another that again. I put the dog up. My training sessions are very, very short at first. And then as the dog gets older, as the dog gets better, then I start elongating. Or I break my behaviors down. I have 10 behaviors. Let's say I have 10 behaviors in order to get through a routine. I'll work on different behaviors each day. And then come trial day, I put them all together. Now, some people think I'm nuts. Some people say you should do your whole routine with your dog today, you know, at least a couple times before trial. But if you guys ever looked at a whole routine, a whole routine is really long. Uh, AKC um, open or a CD is on and off heel leash healing, sitting down. I mean, there's a lot. Your dog is basically in the ring for at least 10 minutes. So basically, you're going to ask your dog to give you attention and look at you for 10 minutes straight. That is a lot. So I don't usually ask my dog to do a whole routine. But I make sure he has all the pieces of the routine down before I do the entire routine. Okay? So start thinking about what you want to focus on while she walks the dog around the room. Okay? Well, she's desensitized the dog. Any questions? Okay. So I know I can put her harness or I can put her candy collar on and we'd be just fine. But that's what I'm going to do today. So okay. I just wanted to find out 
are you trying to see what our worst things are first or just what so we this, do? This is a really good question. So it, it's hard. Well, one of the things you just actually happened to mention is she's never put a flat call on a dog, right? So now all of a sudden she is going to change something up. She's going to change it up and she's going to ask for new behaviors or ask the dog to perform in a new environment. So let me ask you this. Why are you want to use a flat collar? Because I have, I've tried and I, she, won't, she just doesn't want to walk and heal with me on a flat collar. She just charges forward. And I can work with her on a... Okay, can I pick on you for a minute? Sure. Okay, it's because I like you. Okay, if I pick on you, it means I really like you. Okay. So the equipment does not reflect the behavior. I don't care if the dog's on a flat collar, a harness, a pinch collar. If the dog doesn't know healing, the dog doesn't know healing. It's not a, a equipment issue that I, I, I listen to you talk that you have. It's just, hey, we need to maybe address your healing. Okay. However, sometimes equipment we use can sometimes dictate the behavior. Me personally, I'm a, I like the prong collar over a harness, over flat collar, over chain collar. Okay. Um, has anybody ever explained to you guys the concept behind a prong collar? A lot of people actually don't know. What's the concept? Nope. Nope. Oh, that's the worst one. That's the worst one. Well, I was told Elvis is still alive. Okay. Oh, she's almost got it. So um, the best way I can explain it is this. You guys ever see the magician laying a bed of nails? You ever seen that trick? Okay. How does the trick work? Any idea? Even pressure. Okay. Yes. Weight distribution is actually the, the scientific, okay? Weight distribution, okay? So if we have a piece of plywood, we have 10,000 nails in the plywood, okay? You can lay on the plywood and we have more surface area, okay? If you take away half the nails, spread them out, now there's no way you can do the trick. The prong collar works on the same principle. So we have a bunch of prongs evenly distributed on the neck. When the dog pulls, the weight is evenly distributed around the dog's neck so it's uncomfortable for the dog to pull. It does not pinch the dog and has nothing to do with mama. So it's okay, it's okay, but we're, we're learning. So if you can find anything different, I'd be really interested. But after, after four weeks, five weeks, mama's usually not with the puppies. So the five weeks of behavior is not gonna carry over to seven years later, okay? All right, young lady, what are we working on? Okay, so let's-, let's So let's talk to her about her engagement. Can I? I'm really gonna pick on you because you're the very first dog. I know. Thank you, sir. Is that okay? Thank you, sir. Okay.